Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we will be dealing with dural folds and venous sinuses. I am Dr. Daksha Dikshit, Professor of Anatomy from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Kaili Academy of Higher Education and Research, Belagavi. Let us first go and have a look at this clinical case scenario. A 40 year old male accidentally fell on the face while playing cricket and injured his nose and upper lip. A few days later, he presented to the OPD with severe pain in the right eye and forehead. He also complained of diplopia and drooping of the left eyelid. Clinical examination of the patient revealed marked edema of the left eyelid with exophthalmus. And the clinical diagnosis was cavernous sinus thrombosis. Let us just keep these symptoms in mind as we go through the class, we will know why it has occurred and how the diagnosis was reached. We will be dealing with the dural folds and the venous sinuses under these headings. Introduction, dural folds, we will be studying all four of them that is the fax cerebri, tentorium cerebelli, Fox cerebelli and diaphragma cella. Then we will go on to the dural venous sinuses where we do the classification. We go into details of the cavernous sinus and the superior sagittal sinus and all the other sinuses as well. And finally, we will go on to the applied anatomy. Introduction. Meninges, as we all know, are composed of three membranous connective tissue layers which support and protect the brain and the spinal cord. These are the dura mater, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Dura mater is thick external fibrous layer and in the cranium, the cranial dura has two layers, an outer endosteal layer which is nothing but the endocranium of the skull bone while the inner layer is the meningeal layer. The next is the arachnoid matter which is a thin intermediate layer. It spreads out by fibrous strands like a spider's web between the dura mater and the deeper pia mater. The pia mater is a delicate internal vasculated layer. This also has two layers, an outer epipia which lines the arachnoid matter and the inner pia glial or pia intimal layer which is going to be closely attached to all the irregularities of the central nervous system. Thus here we can have various spaces between these three layers of the meninges. There can be a space between the dura mater and the skull bone which could be the extra dural space but in normal individuals as the endosteal layer of the dura mater forms the endocranium hence in the cranial dura there is no extra dural space. There is a space between dura mater and arachnoid matter which we call as the subdural space which is lined by a thin film of tissue fluid and shows the presence of the cerebral veins on their way to draining into the venous sinuses. There is a space between the arachnoid matter and the pia mater which is the subarachnoid space which is filled with the cerebrospinal fluid and the cerebral arteries. There is no sub pile space 
as we have seen that the inner layer of pia matter which is the pia intima is closely attached to the nervous tissue. What are the functions of these meninges? These meninges protect the brain, they form the supporting framework for the arteries, veins as well as the venous sinuses. They enclose the fluid filled cavity, the subarachnoid space which is uh, vital for the normal functioning of the brain tissue. Going on to the cranial dura mater, as I have already said, it is a thick, dense, bilaminar membrane and is also called as the pachymenynx. It is adherent to the inner table or the internal table of the calvaria. It has got two layers, an external periosteal layer which forms the periosteum covering the internal surface of the calvarium and an internal layer which is the meningeal layer. This is a strong fibrous membrane which is continuous around the foramen magnum with the spinal dura mater. These two layers are intimately fused to each other and are inseparable except at places where the meningeal layer goes deeper in folds and that is how it gives rise to the dural folds within which the dural sinuses are placed. This is a picture showing coronal sections passing through the cranium. What we see here is the two layers of dura mater, the outer endosteal layer and the inner meningeal layer. As we can see all along these two layers are inseparable except at places where the meningeal layer goes deeper, folds on itself, comes back and continues along with the endosteal layer. These infoldings give rise to formation of the dural folds. This dural fold is the fax cerebri which lies in the median longitudinal fissure of the brain tissue. These areas where the two layers are separated give rise to spaces within which the dural venous sinuses are placed. Thus we can see the fax cerebri here. We can also see the tentorium cerebelli. At a more posterior plane, we can see the fax cerebelli which separates partially the two cerebellar hemispheres. And this picture shows us a clear view of the tentorium cerebelli also which separates the supratentorial compartment which contains the cerebrum from the infra tentorial compartment which contains the cerebellum. So, we have now seen what these dural venous folds are and how they give rise to spaces within which the dural venous sinuses are placed. Internal meningeal layer is a sustanticular or supporting layer that reflects away from the external periosteal layer thus giving rise to reflections which are called as the dural infoldings. What do these dural infoldings do? These divide the cranial cavity into compartments. They form incomplete partitions or dural septae between certain parts of the brain tissue. They provide support, they act as shock absorbers and they also restrict rotatory displacement of the brain tissue. There are four named dural folds, fax cerebri or the cerebral fax, tentorium cerebelli or cerebellar tentorium, fax cerebelli or cerebellar fax and diaphragma cella or the cellar diaphragm. This picture shows us the fax cerebri which is a large sickle shaped dural fold. What we see here transversely placed is the tent shaped tentorium cerebelli. Let us now see the fax cerebri. It is a sickle shaped largest dural infolding. It lies 
in the median longitudinal cerebral fissure. It has two ends, anterior and posterior, two borders, a superior attached border and an inferior free border. It has two surfaces, right and left. The superior border attaches in the median plane of the interior or internal surface of calvaria, extending from the frontal crest of frontal bone and the crista gali of ethmoid bone anteriorly to the internal occipital protuberance posteriorly. Posteriorly, it is also continuous with the superior surface of the tentorium cerebelli by its posterior end which is broad. This picture shows us the Fox cerebri. This is the sickle shaped Fox cerebri having an anterior end related or attached to the Christagelae. From there is the upper or superior attached border which goes posteriorly right up to the internal occipital protuberance. This what we see here is the inferior free border, anterior end and this broad structure is the posterior end which attaches to the superior surface of the tentorium cerebelli. There are venous sinuses related to the Fox cerebri. Related to its upper attached border is the superior sagittal sinus. Similarly, along its inferior free border, it shows the presence of the inferior sagittal sinus. And along the posterior end, which is attached to the superior surface of the tentorium cerebelli, it shows the presence of the straight sinus. Thus, there are these three dural venous sinuses related to the Fox cerebri, the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus. We go on to the next dural fold, the tentorium cerebelli. This is the second largest dural infolding resembling a single pole tent. It is a wide crescentric septum which separates the occipital lobes of cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellum. It has an outer attached border and an inner U-shaped free border which is called as the tentorial notch or incisure. It attaches rostrally to the clinoid processes of the sphenoid bone, rostrolaterally to the pictus part of the temporal bone and posterolaterally to the internal surface of the occipital bone and part of the parietal bone. This picture shows us the tentorium cerebelli. This outer border is the attached border which is attached to the clinoid processes, then to the pictus part of the temporal bone and then on to the occipital and the parietal bones. That is the outer attached border while the inner free border is a U-shaped notch-like structure which is called as the tentorial notch. This structure here seen is the tent-shaped tentorium cerebelli showing attached outer border and a free U-shaped inner border called as the tentorial notch. The Fox cerebri as we have seen attaches by its posterior broad end to the superior surface of the tentorium cerebelli and holds it up in a tent like manner. The tentorium cerebelli divides the cranial cavity into two compartments, the supratentorial compartment and the infratentorial compartment. The supratentorial compartment is further divided into right and left halves by the Fox cerebri. The concave antromedial border is free, producing a U-shaped gap 
which is called as the tentorial notch and it is through this tentorial notch that the brain stem extends from the posterior into the middle cranial fossa. What is seen here in this picture is the tentorium cerebelli and this is the free U-shaped tentorial notch through which the brain stem passes. What are the venous sinuses related to the tentorium cerebelli? The superior petrosal sinus is situated rostrolaterally along the outer attached border on both the sides. The transverse sinus is situated posterolaterally along the outer attached border bilaterally, while the straight sinus is seen on the superior surface of the tentorium cerebelli where this superior surface meets with the posterior broad end of the fax cerebri in the midline. So, tentorium cerebelli has two superior petrosal sinuses and two transverse sinuses, one on either side related or lying on its attached border while it has got the straight sinus, a single unpaired sinus in the midline related to its superior surface. We now go on to the Fox cerebelli. This again is a sickle shaped vertical dural infold seen in the infratentorial compartment. It partially separates the two cerebellar hemispheres. It lies inferior to the tentorium cerebelli in the posterior part of the posterior cranial fossa. It has two ends, superior and inferior, two borders, posterior attached border and anterior free border. The superior end is broad and is attached to the inferior surface of the tentorium cerebelli. The posterior border is attached to the internal occipital crest and it partially separates the two cerebellar hemispheres. This picture shows us the sickle shaped fox cerebelli. As we can see, the upper end is broad and is attached to the inferior surface of the tentorium cerebelli, while the lower end is pointed and is attached to the posterior border of the foramen magnum. The posterior border of the Fox cerebelli is attached to the internal occipital crest, while the anterior border is free. The Fox cerebelli has only one venous sinus related to it and that is seen along the posterior border of the Fox cerebelli and that one is the occipital sinus. Then we go on to the fourth dural infold which is diaphragma cella. This is the smallest of the dural infoldings. A circular sheet of dura that is suspended between the clinoid processes forming a partial roof over the hypophyseal fossa of the sphenoid bone. It covers the pituitary gland in this fossa and also has an aperture for passage of the infundibulum and the hypophyseal veins. This picture shows us the diaphragma cella which is a small circular fold of dura mater attached between the clinoid processes. Then we go on to study the dural venous sinuses. These are endothelium lined blood filled spaces between the periosteal and the meningeal layers of dura. As we have already seen earlier, we have said that the two layers of the cranial dura, the endosteal and the meningeal layer are inseparable except at a few places where the meningeal layer leaves, goes deeper, folds on itself and comes back and joins with the endosteal layer. The places or the areas where these two layers are separated is where the dural venous sinuses are present. 
So, most of the dural venous sinuses are present between the spaces which lie between the periosteal and the meningeal layers of the dura mater except two venous sinuses, the inferior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus are present in spaces between the meningeal layer of dura mater where the meningeal layer folds on itself or meningeal layer of one dural fold meets with meningeal layer of another dural venous fold. All other venous sinuses are present between or in the spaces which are between the endosteal and the meningeal layer of dura mater. The walls of these dural venous sinuses are thick and composed of fibrous tissue. They have no muscular tissue, they have no valves. Large veins from the surface of the brain empty their blood into these sinuses and ultimately drain through them into the internal jugular veins. Some venous sinuses may also receive the cerebrospinal fluid through the arachnoid granulations. How do we classify these dural venous sinuses? They are classified as paired sinuses which are 8 in number and unpaired sinuses which are 7 in number. The paired sinuses are cavernous sinus, the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, the superior petrosal sinus, the inferior petrosal sinus, sphenoparietal sinus, petrosquamous sinus and the middle meningeal veins. While the unpaired sinuses are seen in the midline and they are the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, occipital sinus, anterior and posterior intercavernous sinuses and the basilar venous plexus. Let us now study the cavernous sinus. Situation. This is a large venous sinus located on either side of the cella tersica on the upper surface of body of the sphenoid bone which contains the sphenoid air sinus. What is the extent of the cavernous sinus? It extends from the medial end of the superior orbital fissure anteriorly to the apex of pitreous part of temporal bone posteriorly. It measures about 2 cm in length and 1 cm in width. Formation. It is formed by the separation or the space between the meningeal and the endosteal layers of dura mater. The sinus is filled with venous blood and is covered with an endothelial lining. The sinus has roof, floor, medial wall and lateral wall. The roof and lateral wall are formed by the meningeal layer of cranial dura mater, while the floor and medial wall are formed by the endosteal layer. The important relations of the cavernous sinus Within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, we see presence of four cranial nerves. From superior to inferior, these are the third cranial nerve that is the oculomotor nerve. Next is the fourth cranial nerve which is the trochlear nerve. Next comes the first division of the trigeminal nerve that is the ophthalmic nerve and inferior most is the second division of the trigeminal nerve which is the maxillary nerve. While within the substance of the cavernous sinus, we see presence of two structures, the internal carotid artery and the sixth cranial nerve that is the abducent nerve. These two structures travel through the sinus. The pulsations of the artery within the sinus promotes the propulsion of venous blood from the sinus along with the force of gravity. This picture shows us a coronal section passing through the cavernous sinus. Let us first see the external relations of cavernous sinus. 
This what we see here is the cavernous sinus. It is related superiorly to the optic chiasma and also to the internal carotid artery after it has left or pierced the roof of the cavernous sinus. Medially, it is related to the pituitary gland which lies in the pituitary fossa of the sphenoid bone and the sphenoid air sinus which lies in the body of the sphenoid bone. Laterally, it is related to the uncus part of the temporal lobe of the cerebral hemisphere and also to the trigeminal ganglion. Inferiorly, it is related to the sphenoid bone, the junction of the body of sphenoid bone with the greater wing of sphenoid bone and also to the foramen lacerum. These are the external relations of the cavernous sinus. Within the cavernous sinus, the structures related, this as we said is the roof of the cavernous sinus, this is the medial wall, the floor and the lateral wall. Along the lateral wall as we have already said there is the four cranial nerves which are seen from superior to inferior. These are the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, the ophthalmic nerve and the maxillary nerve. Within the substance of the cavernous sinus we see the internal carotid artery and inferolateral to it we see presence of the abducent nerve. These nerves which are seen along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Let us trace these nerves and see what happens to them further. The oculomotor nerve enters the cavernous sinus through the posterior part of the sinus. It travels along the lateral wall of the sinus and then it divides into its two rami, the upper and the lower rami and these two rami will leave the cavernous sinus and enter into the superior orbital fissure. The trochlear nerve also passes through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and enters the orbital, the superior orbital fissure. The ophthalmic nerve travels in the lateral wall and divides into its three branches that is the frontal, lacrimal and nasociliary nerves and all these three nerves leave the cavernous sinus and enter into the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary nerve travels along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and leaves the sinus by passing through the foramen rotundum. The internal carotid artery enters the cavernous sinus from the posterior aspect, travels as the content within the cavernous sinus, then takes a 90 degrees bend superiorly, pierces the roof of the cavernous sinus and that is how it leaves the cavernous sinus. The abducent nerve travels all along the cavernous sinus, inferolateral to the internal carotid artery, leaves the sinus and passes through the superior orbital fissure. Those were the external relations and the relations of the structures lying within the cavernous sinus. Let us now see what are the tributaries of the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus basically receives venous blood from three areas. It receives venous blood from the eyeball, from the brain tissue and from the meninges. It receives the superior ophthalmic vein, the inferior ophthalmic vein and the central vein of retina from the eyeball. From the brain tissue, it receives venous blood via the superficial middle cerebral vein and the inferior cerebral veins and from the meninges it receives through the sphenoparietal sinus and the frontal or anterior trunk of the middle meningeal vein. The blood which is which it thus collects from these tributaries, where does it go to? These are the communications that the cavernous sinus has. Venous channels in these sinuses will communicate with each other through the anterior and the posterior intercavernous sinuses. These sinuses are nothing but connecting 
channels between the two cavernous sinuses of either side. Sinus also drains posterior inferiorly or communicates posterior inferiorly through the superior and the inferior petrosal sinuses. The superior petrosal sinus communicates posteriorly to the transverse sinus at a point where the transverse sinus continues as the sigmoid sinus, while the inferior petrosal sinus communicates posteriorly into the sigmoid sinus, the point where it continues as the internal jugular vein. The cavernous sinus also communicates with the basilar venous plexus and the pterygoid plexus of veins through emissary veins. This picture here shows us the tributaries as well as the communications of the cavernous sinus. This what we see here is the cavernous sinus. Tributaries, three tributaries which it receives from the eyeball and those are the superior ophthalmic vein, the central vein of retina and the inferior ophthalmic vein. From the brain tissue, it receives two tributaries that is the superficial middle cerebral vein and the inferior cerebral veins. From the meninges, it receives via the sphenoparietal sinus and the frontal or anterior trunk of the middle meningeal vein. Thus, we can see that the cavernous sinus receives blood from three areas, from the eyeball, from the brain tissue and from the meninges. This blood is then communicated posterolaterally by the superior petrosal sinus which drains into the junction between the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus. It also drains posteriorly through the inferior petrosal sinus into the junction of the sigmoid sinus and the internal jugular vein. The cavernous sinus communicates with the pterygoid plexus of veins through emissary veins. These emissary veins leave the skull by passing through the foramen ovale, foramen spinosum and the foramen lacerum. It also communicates with the facial vein by two roots through the supraorbital vein and the angular vein and the other route is through the deep facial vein which drains into the facial vein. And as we have already seen earlier, one cavernous sinus communicates with the other cavernous sinus through the anterior and posterior intercavernous sinuses. We now go on to see the superior sagittal sinus. This sinus lies in the convex attached border of the Fox cerebri. It begins at the crista gali and ends near the internal occipital protuberance at a point which is called the confluence of sinuses or the torcula hirophili. This confluence of sinuses is nothing but a meeting point of the superior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, occipital sinus and the two transverse sinuses and it lies just anterior to the internal occipital protuberance. The superior sagittal sinus is triangular on cross section and it receives the superior cerebral veins and communicates on each side through slit like openings with the lateral venous lacunae, lateral expansions of the superior sagittal sinus. The interior of this sinus presents openings of the superior cerebral veins, subarachnoid granulations, numerous fibrous bands which are seen crossing the inferior angle of the sinus and it also shows openings of three venous lacunae on each side of the sinus. The lacunae are nothing but irregular venous spaces intervening between the two layers of the cranial dura and are known as the frontal, parietal 
and occipital lacunae. They collect blood from the diploic and meningeal veins. The tributaries of the superior sagittal sinus are 8 to 12 superior cerebral veins, diploic veins and emissary veins. The superior sagittal sinus when traced posteriorly usually it terminates or continues as the right transverse sinus. This here we see a sagittal section passing through the cranium which shows us the superior sagittal sinus which is present along the superior attached border of the fax cerebri and extends posteriorly up to the confluence of sinuses. What we see here is a cross section through the superior sagittal sinus where here it appears triangular in cross section. It also shows the, the sorry I will repeat. What we see here is a sagittal section passing through the cranium which shows the presence of the fax cerebri and along its attached superior border we see the superior sagittal sinus. We can trace it posteriorly up to the confluence of sinuses. What we see here is a transverse section or a cross section passing through the superior sagittal sinus where the sinus is seen as triangular space between the two layers of cranial dura. We also see the arachnoid granulations which are draining into this sinus. The arachnoid granulations or collection of arachnoid villi are tufted prolongations of arachnoid matter that protrude through the meningeal layer of dura matter into the dural venous sinuses especially the lateral lacunae and they affect the transfer of the cerebrospinal fluid back into the venous system. We now go on to see the inferior sagittal sinus. The picture here shows us the superior sagittal sinus along the attached border of the fax cerebri and this is the inferior sagittal sinus which lies along the free inferior border of the fax cerebri. If we trace the inferior sagittal sinus posteriorly, it continues as the straight sinus. The straight sinus is formed by the union of the inferior sagittal sinus and the great cerebral vein of Galen. So, the inferior sagittal sinus is much smaller than the superior sagittal sinus. It runs in the inferior concave free border of the fax cerebri and it ends posteriorly in the straight sinus. The straight sinus, it is formed by the union of the inferior sagittal sinus with the great cerebral vein of Galen. This great cerebral vein of Galen is formed by the union of the internal cerebral veins and the basal vein. The straight sinus runs inferoposteriorly along the line of attachment of the posterior broad end of the fax cerebri with the superior surface of the tentorium cerebelli. When traced posteriorly, the straight sinus ends at the confluence of sinuses. It usually terminates or continues as the left transverse sinus. This is a picture showing us the same, the inferior sagittal sinus joining with the great cerebral vein to form the straight sinus and the straight sinus reaching the confluence of sinuses and then from there on it usually continues as the left transverse sinus. We now go on to study the transverse sinuses. These sinuses pass laterally from the confluence of sinuses forming a groove in the occipital bones and the posterior inferior angles of the parietal bones. They course along the posterolateral attached margins of the tentorium cerebelli. 
they continue as the sigmoid sinuses as they approach the posterior aspect of the petrous temporal bones. In about 80% of individuals, the superior sagittal sinus continues as the right transverse sinus, whereas the straight sinus continues as the left transverse sinus. In the remaining 20% of individuals, it is vice versa. This picture shows us the transverse sinuses. This is the confluence of sinuses and this is the right transverse sinus and the left transverse sinus. Transverse sinus subsequently continuing as the S-shaped sigmoid sinus. We now go on to see the sigmoid sinuses. These follow the S-shaped course along the posterior cranial fossa. They form deep grooves in the temporal and the occipital bones, turn anteriorly and then continue inferiorly as the internal jugular vein after traversing through the jugular foramen. The picture here shows us the two transverse sinuses on either side, each continuing as an S-shaped sigmoid sinus and the sigmoid sinus in turn continuing as the internal jugular vein. We now go on to study the occipital sinus. The occipital sinus lies in the attached posterior border of the Fark cerebelli. It ends superiorly in the confluence of sinuses. It communicates inferiorly with the internal vertebral venous plexus. The picture here shows us the midline structure which is the occipital sinus related or lying in the posterior attached border of the Fox cerebelli. We move on to study the superior petrosal sinus. Each sinus lies in the anterolateral attached margin of the tentorium cerebelli which attaches to the superior border of the petrous part of the temporal bone. This sinus communicates between the cavernous sinus and the transverse sinus at a point where the transverse sinus curves inferiorly to continue as the sigmoid sinus. The picture here shows us the two cavernous sinuses and this here is the superior petrosal sinus communicating the cavernous sinus with the point or to the point which is the junction between the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus. We also see the inferior petrosal sinus here which communicates between the cavernous sinus going posteriorly up to a point where the sigmoid sinus continues as the internal jugular vein. So, the inferior petrosal sinus as we said is a sinus that runs in a groove between the petrous part of temporal bone and the basilar part of the occipital bone. It connects the cavernous sinus directly to the point where the sigmoid sinus continues as the internal jugular vein at the jugular foramen. We now move on to see the sphenoparietal sinus. It is an inconstant dural venous channel lying under the lesser wing of sphenoid bone near its posterior edge. It curves medially to open into the anterior part of the cavernous sinus. It receives small veins from adjacent dura. Sometimes it also receives the frontal trunk of the middle meningeal vein connecting rami from the superficial middle cerebral vein, temporal lobe veins and the anterior temporal diploic vein. The basilar venous plexus. This consists of interconnecting channels between the two layers of dura mater on the clivus. It connects the inferior petrosal sinuses and communicates inferiorly with the internal vertebral venous plexus. This picture shows us the 
two cavernous sinuses on either side of the sphenoid bone and just posterior to it on the surface of the clivus we see this interconnecting channels of veins and that is the basilar venous plexus. Marginal sinus. This sinus encircles the foramen magnum. It communicates anteriorly with the basilar plexus of veins and with the occipital sinus posteriorly. It drains to the sigmoid sinus or into the jugular bulb by way of smaller sinuses. It may connect the extracranial veins to the internal vertebral venous plexus or paravertebral or deep cervical veins in the suboccipital region. Let us now see the petrosquamous sinus. This sinus is basically an emissary vein that courses over the lateral superior surface of the petrous part of the temporal bone. It arises from dorsolateral portion of the transverse sinus before the transverse sinus confluences or meets with the superior petrosal sinus. It drains anterolaterally into the retromandibular vein and anteromedially into the pterygoid venous plexus. It usually disappears during development of the adult venous pattern in the last three months of the prenatal life. Emissary veins. These veins connect the dural venous sinuses with veins outside the cranium. They are valveless and the blood may flow in both the directions, but it usually flows away from the brain tissue. Size and number of these emissary veins may vary. This may lead to spread of infection from extracranial foci to venous sinuses. It may also provide alternative drainage pathways in cases of venous sinus thrombosis. And examples of these emissary veins are frontal, parietal, mastoid, and posterior condylar emissary veins. Now we go on to see the applied anatomy of these topics. Extradural hematoma. The separation of dura from the cranial bones requires significant force. Occurs due to high pressure arterial bleed in this space most common in the middle meningeal artery bleed which follows skull fractures due to direct blow to the skull bone. Acts as a rapidly expanding intracranial mass lesion causing acute brain compression and displacement. It is a classical medical emergency and requires immediate diagnosis and surgery through craniotomy for the clot evacuation and coagulation of the ruptured vessels. As we have already seen earlier, in normal individuals there is no extradural space. But in case there is a fracture of the skull bone with rupture of the meningeal vessels, then that will give rise to collection of blood or hematoma in the subdural space. Sorry, I will repeat. We now go on to study the applied anatomy of these topics. Extradural hematoma. This is separation of the dura from the cranial bones which requires significant force. It occurs due to high pressure arterial bleed in this space, most common in the middle meningeal artery. The middle meningeal artery bleeds following a skull fracture because of direct blow or trauma to the skull bones. This hematoma acts as a rapidly expanding intracranial mass lesion causing acute brain compression and displacement. It is a classical medical emergency which requires immediate diagnosis and surgery through craniotomy for clot evacuation and 
coagulation of the ruptured vessels. As we have seen earlier that in normal individuals there is no extradural space. But in case there is a trauma to the skull bone causing fracture of the skull bones and bleeding or rupture of the middle meningeal vessels then it gives rise to collection of blood or hematoma in the extradural space. The picture here shows us a coronal section passing through the cranium. These are the three layers of the meninges as are seen in this magnified view, the dura mater, the arachnoid and the pia mater with the deep seated brain tissue. And this here is the collection of blood or hematoma in the extra dural space due to rupture of the meningeal vessels and fracture of the skull bones. So that is extra dural hemorrhage. Next we see the tentorial herniation. This is space occupying lesions such as tumors in the supra tentorial compartment which give rise to increased intracranial pressure and that is how part of the temporal bone mostly the uncus part of the temporal lobe will herniate through the tentorial notch. The temporal lobe in this process may be lacerated as well as the third cranial nerve that is the oculomotor nerve may get stretched, compressed or both. The picture here shows us a coronal section passing through the normal position of the brainstem and what we see here is central herniation of the brain tissue through the tentorial notch so that it comes into the infratentorial compartment. So that is tentorial herniation of the brain tissue. Next is lesions in the smaller infratentorial compartment. This could lead to upward herniation of the cerebellar vermis that is an upward transtentorial herniation or a downward herniation of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum which is called the tonsillar herniation. These again are neurosurgical emergencies which require suboccipital craniectomy. The picture here shows us different types of herniations like the uncle herniation which we saw in the previous applied anatomy point. There could be a central herniation, cingulate herniation, upward herniation, tonsillar herniation or a downward herniation. We then move on to see the carotico-cavernous sinus fistula and cavernous sinus thrombosis. This is what had happened in our clinical case scenario. A carotico-cavernous sinus fistula is nothing but a direct communication between the intracavernous portion of the internal carotid artery and the venous blood within the cavernous sinus. It occurs due to severe head injury or aneurysmal vessel disease. In our case study, the person had fallen on the face, so that was a severe head injury which had led to this communication. And the signs of this situation are ptosis, proptosis which may be pulsatile, chemosis, periorbital edema, extraocular dysmotility causing diplopia due to involvement of the third, fourth and the sixth cranial nerves, dilated tortuous retinal veins and papilledema which may cause permanent blindness. Then we go on to see thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. This may occur due to spread of infection from the nose scalp or the diploic tissue and it is manifested by signs of increased intracranial tension resulting from the defective absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid. As we have seen that the superior sagittal sinus receives 
the cerebrospinal fluid through the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations. If the superior striatal sinus is thrombosed, it will be unable to receive the cerebrospinal fluid thus giving rise to increased intracranial tension. Next we go on to see that any infection from the upper nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses, cheek, upper lip, anterior nares, upper incisor or canine tooth may lead to septic thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. This occurs through the communication which the cavernous sinus has with the facial vein, with the pterygoid plexus of veins, ophthalmic veins and the emissary veins. So, any of these areas having infection, the infection could spread to the cavernous sinus through these roots. It is a critical medical emergency with a high risk of disseminated cerebritis as well as cerebral venous thrombosis. Next we see bulging of the diaphragma cella. This is caused due to the pituitary tumours that extend superiorly leading to disturbances in the endocrine function as well as visual symptoms. Thus, we have seen the various infoldings of the dural I'll repeat. One second. Ah, one here. Let us now go on to see how infections in the extracranial tissues can spread to the cavernous sinus. Infection from the upper nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, cheek, upper lip, anterior nares, upper incisor or canine tooth may lead to septic thrombosis of the cavernous sinus through the communication which the cavernous sinus has with the facial vein, the pterygoid plexus of veins, ophthalmic veins and the emissary veins. This is a critical medical emergency with high risk of disseminated cerebritis and cerebral venous thrombosis. Next we see the bulging of the diaphragma cella. This is caused due to pituitary tumours that extend superiorly leading to disturbances in the endocrine function as well as visual symptoms. Next point is metastasis of tumour cells to the dural venous sinuses. The basilar venous plexus and the occipital sinus communicate through the foramen magnum with the internal vertebral venous plexus. These venous channels are valveless. Hence, compression of the thorax, abdomen or pelvis during heavy coughing or straining may force venous blood from these regions into the internal vertebral venous system and from there into the dural venous sinuses. Thus, pus from an abscess in these areas as well as tumor cells may spread to the vertebrae and the brain tissue. Thus, we have seen in the entire class, we started off with the meninges layers. We went on to see the two layers of the cranial dura. We saw the four dural infoldings or the dural folds. We then went on to see the dural venous sinuses. We classified them. We saw details of cavernous sinus, superior striatal sinus and all the other venous sinuses. And then we went on to see the applied anatomy points related to the dural folds and the dural venous sinuses. We started with a clinical case scenario and as we went through the lecture, we understood the various symptoms that were seen in that clinical case scenario and how it was diagnosed as the cavernous sinus thrombosis case. Thank you.